It is my great pleasure right now to welcome to the stage producer and actor Kate Courtleo, writer director Rachel Carey, and stars Chloe Levine and Ben Rappaport. So I wanted to start by um, asking you a few questions, Kate, about the origin of the film, because you initiated this becoming a film and creating a treatment for it after seeing a documentary called When She's Beautiful, She's Angry, which is great. And this was just a tiny, tiny snippet of the documentary. It actually wasn't what it was about. So what was it that made you watch that film and see the prospect of a feature narrative from it? Well, the, the reason I was there, is this on? Can you hear me? Uh, the reason I was there in the first place is because I, I'm a feminist, I, I'm an activist, I volunteer with Planned Parenthood, and I'm an actor, and I knew I wanted to create something, and I didn't know what it was gonna be. And when I learned about the Jane Collective in this doc, it literally, not to get super woo-woo on you, but it kind of felt like the universe was just giving me this message straight into my brain saying, you have to make a movie about these women. And it really was just gonna be about the story. I just felt like it was this incredible piece of women's history that I'd never heard of, and if I hadn't, how many others hadn't? and I just wanted to share it. Had any, of the <laughs> had any of the rest of you had any awareness of this collective or was your first introduction through being pulled into the process of this film? No, th this, this film was the, my first um, awareness of, of any of this and it was absolutely fascinating and getting to, to meet uh, one of the original Janes, uh, Judith Arcana, who's heavily involved in the film was, was really fascinating. And then I also wanted to ask how in depth you went with the initial treatment, how much of the story of what we see on the final screen is mapped out before you went to Rachel, and then how did the story evolve once you guys were working together? It was totally different. I, I, I had the idea and I, I wrote out a little treatment and it, was, it started on a, on a street corner and the woman was waiting for a car and I, I just sketched out what was in my brain and did a lot of research just online and it was really, you know, early research and I took it to Rachel right away because we're part of a theater company together and she's one of my favorite writers I know. And I was like, here's my idea. What do you think about writing a script and making a part for me and we'll make it together? <laughs> and, and the script is, is so much beyond I, what I could have ever imagined. So you can talk to that. Yep. Um, yeah, I expanded a little bit on what, <laughs> what Kate brought. I think she, she was the sort of primary researcher on a lot of it, so I was, I was sort of uh, putting together a story and then going, is this right? <laughs> and then, you know, and I got into research later, but sh I would say she was primarily the source for a lot of that. And then, and then Judith Arcana got involved. She sort of found us and set us right on a lot of stuff. And yeah. then we rewrote it again to make sure it was is ac as accurate as possible. So. And the research I was doing, like the, that first pass was online, but after that I was just spending like weeks in the New York Public Library getting old newspaper clippings and magazines and things from the actual time period and just trying to really triangulate resources to make sure it was all in the public domain so we wouldn't bump into any lawsuits. <laughs> and then because you both come from this theatre background, was there anything about that particular sensibility of creating stories and portraying stories that you felt really lent itself to the film and how it came together? I think we have a shared vocabulary of sorts because we've worked together for years. I think we roped in a lot of actors from our theater friends. Yeah. So <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of theater theater friends up there. So that was part of it. A lot of favors from our company yeah. up there. <laughs> yes, including a lot of locations too. So. Yeah, like all the locations. <laughs> And Chloe, I know that you, you auditioned for them. Do you remember what scene it was that you actually had as your audition piece from the film? Yeah, I actually auditioned for not Barb. I auditioned for uh, the the girl I, Patty who tries to kill herself, and that was my audition. And then I got offered a completely different part. <laughs> <laughs> and for you, Ben, you kind of came straight into the project without auditioning. But what were some of the early conversations that you had with Kate and with Rachel, and what were the things that were important for you to know about your character? Yeah, I, I was, um, uh, it all I think came through Eve Battaglia, who was the casting director on this film. Uh, and um, so I, I was working in Los Angeles at the time and uh, I wasn't able to, uh, to meet with these guys. So I was, sitting in a, um, I was sitting in a coffee shop 
on Wilshire and and the the Wi-Fi reception was really bad and I was having a Skype call with Rachel just so we could, she could see that I wasn't crazy. She could see that I was not crazy. Yeah, that's right. We were fe- a mutual, you know, a mutual feeling out of each other. Um, and but I could tell even through that uh, conversation that Rachel uh, and Kate were artists that I wanted to work with. I was just I was super impressed with the script, and I you know I'm one of the reasons I became an actor is because I'm a history nerd, and and learning about this part of our history was was really incredible and really eye opening to me. So I was just really ready to dive in and 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 work with these guys and discover all of this. Yeah, and also for the for the two of you, for Ben and Chloe, how much backstory did you feel that you needed to develop for your characters? Because I always think it's really interesting when you're not in every scene, but you're bringing such a rich three dimensional portrayal of who your characters are. Yeah. How much backstory? I mean, huh, that's a tricky one to answer. I mean. I uh, I feel like me and Kate had some conversations about you know just before production started about where we were coming from, uh, but I I, I, can't, I wouldn't say that we did a crazy amount of work on like a character bible or anything like that. A lot of it was sort of um, converse, doing the work and conversating on the day and really sort of playing around in that way. It was really cool. I knew what her song was. Yeah, that's right. It was um, it was uh, at the zoo. Uh, Paul Simon. Yeah. And because you mentioned Judith, who's one of the original Janes, were you basing any of the characters kind of quite specifically around her? Because I read an interview where she mentioned having been a teacher. So I was curious if Sarah Steele's character was at all based on her trajectory. Uh, y- yes and no. We sort of I, I took a lot of real stories and and moved them around because we didn't want it to seem like individual characters were tracking with individual people um, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, but, but I would say, yeah, Sarah Steele's character was probably closest to Judith, although Judith was married at the time, rather, you know, to a, to a man and had a sort of a different awakening story. I feel Which like Joyce is also kind Joyce of Judith. Joyce a little bit, yeah. I, she, I, I remember Judith's story of she was like, she went to some, you know, women's empowerment meeting and then she was like, and all of a sudden I was like, I don't have to be married. And it had just not occurred to her, you know, that was just what everybody did and that was sort of her moment of figuring this stuff out. And then I also wanted to ask you guys about Caroline Hirsch, who's one of the producers on the film, which I think is so interesting because she runs Caroline's on Broadway, is mostly known for giving comedy a voice, and this is a foray into drama. So it's her first foray into producing and for a a story like this. How did her involvement come about and what did her voice lend the project? Um, She came about because I I asked her. Um, Is she here? Hey, how are you? Do you have a seat for her? Um, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm a member of the New York Women in Film and Television. Um, and so when I was initially looking for other producers and financing and everything, I just went through the whole database and Googled each name to see who might be interested. And I found Caroline, and she has this whole history of feminism and working for women's rights. And so I, I met with her and you know, was prepared, had a whole, tre- the whole pitch deck and everything. And we, we ended up just having this amazing hour long conversation about feminism and women's rights and the time period. And at the end she said, I, I want to produce. And it's been. <laughs> you guys, she's one of the most amazing, interesting people that I've ever met. And I'm so happy that she's part of it. And a lot of, um, I mean, she has connections to Gloria Steinem through the Ms. Foundation. Um, which is how Gloria saw the film and gave us that amazing quote of support. And, um, and what was that quote? <laughs> she said, every American should see this movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a huge, huge boon to the film. I think the reason we're as far in the world and have distribution in so many places is largely because of Caroline. I also wanted to ask a little bit about the challenges of a period piece because you were doing this on an independent film budget. 
So it's not like you had masses of resources and yet it really has that authenticity. I know you were just talking about how even the names you were thinking very specifically about what were the names that were really popular around this time period. Well, I think on a budget, you're, you're sometimes shooting for not getting things wrong more than getting everything you want that's right. And so I think that was probably how we approached it was, was making sure that there was nothing wrong for the period and then hoping for the best. But we had a really good uh, creative team as well and for costume and, and our production designer who was and working hair. with us. And hair, yeah. Our production designer was working with tiny, tiny budget and it was her first feature and she did an amazing job, I think, of pulling it together. She really did. And the locations were a huge boon as well because they were, it was these two historic houses in Brooklyn by Prospect Lefferts area, that historic neighborhood, and they were decorated from the time period still. So we just sort of shot in every single room of those houses. <laughs> like they were hospital rooms, they were college dorms, they were apartments, anything we could do. And then given the restricted timeline in which you were making the film, what was your process for working with your actors like Chloe with Ben and just kind of building that rapport and building that trust so that when you all walked onto set on day one, that everyone felt really confident in the project coming together the way you all envisioned? I don't know. Can you guys <laughs> try not to scare people? I think we chatted a little about the time period because I felt very strongly that Bill's character was not a bad guy. He was just very much a product of his time and so I know we had that conversation right and so his um his uh his conditioning you know he, he just didn't know better unfortunately <laughs> yeah true I don't I feel like we maybe talked about just the relationship with Danny the actor who plays my husband and I feel it but I feel like it was really more about uh, like specific moments that were happening emotionally rather than like overarching and this is the time period. Yeah. And were the two of you aware of the fact that you were coming into a film that was essentially going to be asking you to speak very politically as individuals um, outside of your character? Obviously, when you were taking the film to festivals and doing press for it, were those things that you all talked about early on? I think for, I think for us, I, I, at the time, we shot this film two years ago, right? And uh, I don't think we anticipated the current uh, climate with this subject matter. Um, so I, it, that took us by big surprise, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, when, I, when we first started, it was May of 2016. It was before the election even. I, I literally thought it was just gonna be a piece about women's history. Um, and then um, when we were actually in production, we were all, it sort of had taken on this new urgency already. And then every step along the way, every day there's more news. And I'm just so happy that we have something that we can share that's out now already. So instead of saying, hey, we should learn about what it's like if America doesn't have legal access to abortion, we can just say, hey, this is what happens. Mm -hmm. During the initial research process, what were some of the most surprising things that you hadn't anticipated discovering about the way that women would find abortions, the lengths that they would go to, the processes that they would use? The blindfolding was interesting to me. A lot of the doctors wanting to work anonymously. Um, the, uh, the way that they were treated by the people who were willing to give abortions. There were, you know, I remember talking and one of Judith's notes on my early draft script was like, she was like, well, you know, uh, the doctor would just rape them before he gave the abortion, you know, and I was, and she was just fixing some little line I'd gotten wrong. And I was like, I think I, you know, I was like, oh, like that was, there was a whole lot of really creepy stuff that happened because people could take advantage of the fact that nobody was going to report them. And I think that sort of stuff, what, you know, I feel like you've heard about coat hangers, but that sort of stuff um, I hadn't. Um, and it was also interesting, you know, Chicago did work with, the mob was very involved. And then when we've screened it in New York, people have been like, what about Puerto Rico? Because people in New York City, that's where they went if they had the money. So it's been interesting just hearing from people about, you know, the different parts of the country had different solutions too. I also think one of the things that you do so well with the film is you manage to balance and toe that line between having a political voice and activist voice, but also telling real stories and having substantial characters. So how did you go about mapping out and making sure that you were balancing both of those aspects within creating the film? 
Um, for me, I think I just um, tried to shoehorn in as many real stories as I could in various ways and then that let that sort of speak for itself. Um, you know, the, the doctor who wouldn't write birth control pills was my mom's story, um, you know, yelling at the FBI on the phone with my dad's story. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so I no, but I think there were a lot of stories. Even the, the woman who sort of changes her mind and says this is different was a real story I'd read somewhere. So I, I was sort of trying to work in as much accurate stuff and then use that to sort of set the, the terms of the world. Amazing how specific you got with all of that. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, how you have a predominantly female-driven crew, and was that always something that was a goal from the offset? Yep. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we hired the people who were best for the jobs. Yeah. Was, did that create any sort of different dynamic for any of you as actors to what you're used to on sets, because usually there's less parity? Did it change any sort of like tone that you were walking into? I mean, more than anything, it was just exciting seeing who was who was behind the camera. I mean, you know, it didn't change. I mean, we were still doing, we were doing work. You know, we were there to work, and it was an amazing crew, a great group of people. Yeah. I'm also interested for you, Ben. What have you learned through the process of being in this film about the importance and way to be a male ally to women? Because that is so much of the theme and you're a man coming into a very female driven film that right. definitely passes the Bechdel test. I think, uh, yeah, I think quite simply it's uh, for for men, it's about listening and, and hearing the stories and hearing uh, where everyone is coming from and, and, and learning the history behind these things. And literally that's what it is, is just, is just to shut up and listen. That's what I learned. <laughs> And speaking of listening, I imagine that you've probably had people feeling very open, sharing personal experiences with all of you since the film has started making the rounds and had its theatrical release. Is there anything that was, has been really surprising that people have had as a response to the film that you maybe weren't anticipating? I think the, the most moving thing is, is, and Kate and I have both experienced this, is people who, who have come up and said, I never told anyone this before, but I got an illegal abortion in 1967, or they would tell their own stories, and a lot of them hadn't shared it before. And you know, I find um, with film festivals, usually your first question is like, how many shoot days was that? <laughs> you know, and in this case, it was like, in 1968, I haven't ever told anyone, and my daughter's here, and she doesn't know, but you know, so it was, I think it was really gratifying to do something that opened people up to discussing that. That yeah. was for me, that was. I think it holds space for people to talk about this because there's still so much stigma around abortion and there shouldn't be. It's a medical procedure, it's legal, it's safe, and it, it shouldn't be stigmatized. So I'm, I'm excited that it's literally, I think every festival we've gone to, there's been at least one person, if not many, many people who've come to us with their stories. And there was one in Arizona who came with her daughter and said, this was really meaningful for me because I had an abortion, my daughter is here and I had an abortion when I was her age. And now she's here sharing this movie with me. On the opposite end of the spectrum, have you had any experiences of people who maybe are pro-life, anti-abortion, that have seen the film, and maybe it's opened them up to understanding people that they wouldn't have had conversations with previously? That's what I want to happen. If it has, they haven't come and talked to me yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's Josh my Folan biggest wish. Was out in Omaha, he went to the Omaha Film Festival, our, our, our one male producer, and he said somebody came up afterward and was like, I disagree with the film, but I like you as a producer, and let me tell you about it. <laughs> so, but I don't think we've gotten a lot of feedback That's from people. That's where we won audience that award, too. That was where we won audience award with Omaha, which surprised me, yeah. but maybe they, they really need it out there. So. Yeah. And for you, Rachel, I also wanted to ask, this was your first feature film. You'd made a couple of shorts before. What were the biggest challenges for you as a director coming into it that you experienced? Well, it was a tiny budget, so uh, I think a lot of it was... was just um, the way that that played up against time. There was a lot of, you know, there was very minimal coverage and camera movement because of our budget. And so I don't think that would so much a function of doing a feature, but I think just the way that budget pressed against time was probably the biggest challenge. Yeah. And how, how did you guys go about getting financing and getting funding? Was it very grassroots or were you able to just kind of work very closely with your producers and their relationships? 
Well, we, we started initially as a crowdfund um, for Seed and Spark, and I was like, everyone's going to give a dollar, and it's going to go viral, and it's going to be amazing. <laughs> um, but that didn't happen. Um, and, then, and then we started connecting with individual investors, and Caroline was a huge piece of that. Yeah. Thank you. I will say for, for crowdfunding, though, it, you know, it, we got a little bit of money, but it also proved the interest in the project. So I, I wouldn't say don't do it. I think it was a good way to sort of get the ball rolling, but it, it certainly didn't get us too far. <laughs> so. Well, I think it's challenging because it's so much more work than it necessarily seems like it would be at the offset. Um, before we go, I just wanted each of you to kind of take a moment to to just kind of share what you feel personally was the most impactful part of either making the film or the responses that you've had to the film along the way since you first shot it a couple of years ago, maybe starting with you, Ben. Yeah, I think... Um I think the most impactful part of this at this point is uh, the reaction that it's having now in, in, in the current political climate. The fact that it's drawing awareness to um, the sacrifices that were made and what pre-Roe v. Wade America looked like um, as we enter into Lord knows what sort of era we're entering into. Um, and so it's sort of... Uh, for me, it's it's quite poignant that this film is 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 uh, is is getting so many views and that people are able to to absorb it because I I just think that it's an important part of history now to to celebrate. Yeah, I would say just uh, learning about this these group this group of women and reading the script for the first time, I was like, wait, is this real? And uh, just so learning a lot about them. And then also, I don't know, as an actor, it's kind of really special to portray someone who was like a regular person, but a hero. And I mean, that's, yeah, that was something really cool. Yeah, I think the audience response, especially in terms of people feeling like they could talk about something that's difficult was, was probably the most meaningful part for me. I agree with everything that you all said. <laughs> and I don't know, I, I am not saying that we should all learn how to do abortions, but I think it's interesting to note that in a place of need, women have done this for each other before and they can do it for each other again. Thank you so much for sharing this incredible film with all of us this evening. Thank you.